coming up on West Side Stories. Lake Michigan's water levels continue to rise. We visit one of many local communities that are being affected. Plus, the heartwarming story of one Spring Lake family and their journey to create West Michigan's first cancer support group. And February is Human Trafficking Awareness Month. See how Grand Valley State University is helping to raise awareness through the power of art. All that and more next on West Side Stories. West Side Stories is produced by students from the Multimedia Journalism Program at Grand Valley State University. Support also comes from the School of Communications, inspiring thought, perfecting practice. Welcome to West Side Stories. I'm Sean DeWard. And I'm Katie Myers. Lake Michigan's record high water levels are projected to continue throughout 2020. The U.S. Army Corps of Engineers says water levels can increase by as much as 11 inches. And that's bad news for some Grand Haven businesses. Here's Christopher Cooper with more. I'm here in Grand Haven where people have braved the weather to get a look at the Lake Michigan water levels. It's a little bit scary, honestly, to see how high the water comes up. It's really rising I mean like I remember like coming back here I would say 20 years ago and it seemed like there's a lot more beach the beach is getting smaller and smaller and smaller with the higher water levels this means that this could be the last time we see this sand before it's underwater water levels in lakes Michigan and Huron are at very close to an all-time high, as high as they've been since 1986. The high water levels are causing beaches along the West Michigan shoreline to shrink. This may be a problem in the summer for beach goers. <sighs> I hope there's some beach. Um, yeah, it's something we need to be all vigilant about. Um, I guess with it being where it is now, it's going to be a very short beach. Although the beach is shrinking, city manager Pat McGinnis is optimistic about the summer. So even though the water levels will be up, you know, lots of people are in the water anyways. So there'll be room to sit and enjoy and spread out down the beach, I believe. And I think a good number of people are going to want to come here and see the high lake levels. While McGinnis is confident beach goers will be able to adapt, there may be a bigger concern for residents along the beach. Obviously, like... You won't be able to fit as many people on the beach, but I, 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 I'd say that the bigger issue is with the houses along the lake here. You know, I mean, I, I've seen houses fall into the lake. Water erosion along the West Michigan beaches have caused houses to fall in. In Algon County, this home was demolished before falling into the lake. In Grand Haven, the water is almost to the houses. We've got some that are dangerously close that uh, we're doing what we can to help armor those shorelines. The public areas at risk are the city's main concern. Some city streets are flooded. The busy Harbor Street is expected to go underwater if the water continues to rise. Insurance does not cover this. Private property owners understand that that's a, it's a great privilege to own waterfront property, but it comes at a price. And this is one of those seasons that that price is going to be pretty high. Um, our headaches and our um, ongoing uh, involvement and expenditure of funds is focused solely on public infrastructure, sewer lines and water lines and roads and boardwalks and parks and parking lots. These are things we all use. And if we have to spend money on this stuff, it means we have less money to spend everywhere else on everything else that we do. With all these unexpected problems, money also becomes a problem. We did a barely break even budget, you know, things are very, very tight. They always are in government. Uh, so coming up with a sudden onslaught of millions of dollars of expenses has been uh, very uncomfortable. And we're working very hard to stay positive and optimistic and try to take each occurrence that comes up and turn it into an opportunity. Lake Michigan's rising waters have also caused the river to rise. These water levels are well above the averages. According to the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, Lake Michigan is 39 inches above the average for January. With the high lake levels, local businesses are forced to relocate. With groundwater seeping under the Chinook Pier Shopping Center, pumps tried to move the water away from the buildings. But this effort 
may be in vain. He discovered some mold down there in the buildings, and that's really taken us by surprise. It turns out that the cost to uh, mitigate the wet conditions there and remediate the mold and then renovate the buildings is staggering. So we're considering a recommendation to city council at the next city council meeting likely to demolish those buildings, which is a, a huge blow. You know, it's assets worth well over a million dollars that we're just going to lose and no insurance for mold. So we just lose the buildings and it's a very terrible thing. On February 3rd, the city council meeting will go over the next steps for the Chinook Pier Shopping Center. In Grand Haven, I'm Christopher Cooper. The Grand Haven City Council says they have a number of projects planned to help prevent areas from flooding. But if water levels rise this spring, they could have to close the Harbor Island boat launch. For one Michigan family, a diagnosis of cancer was heartbreaking. The patient was an 11-year-old girl. On top of this diagnosis, there was no place close by to get emotional support. Reporter Claudia Sella brings us the heartwarming story of a family that created the first cancer support group in West Michigan. One of the things, the first thing she said was, am I going to die? Tegan Rose of Spring Lake was looking forward to a night of celebrating her 11th birthday with friends when the routine doctor's visit changed her life forever. Diagnosed with leukemia, Tegan and her family began their toughest battle. Mike and I got it in our heads that no, no, we are going to win. That's what we do. That's what roses do. We're going to win. But winning is hard when you're up to bat against cancer. That's why Tegan's parents, Mike and Angela Rose, turn to support groups in Grand Rapids. For families along the lakeshore, the commute is often tiring and not to mention dangerous. That's when Angela had an idea. If a support group doesn't exist, she thought, then we'll make one. When the devastating news of Tegan's diagnosis spread, community members like Renee Denslow wanted to know how they could help. My kids went to school with their children, and right away when Tegan was diagnosed, I was aware of what was happening to their family. From the grace of God, we just kind of connected, and I told him my idea, and I wanted to find out, number one, if there was anything on the lake shore. And it turns out there wasn't. Renee Denslow is the executive director of Bluebird Cancer Retreats. Bluebird provides support programs to families along the lakeshore affected by adult cancer. Programs offered by Bluebird include retreats, family camps, and various support groups, all aimed at helping families find their strength again. However, their programs have not extended to those affected by pediatric cancer. That is, until now. Everyone kept saying Bluebird and Renee Denslow, and I was like, okay, I really need to meet this Renee. Well, Angela approached me and um, shared her idea and her vision for bringing a support group to the lakeshore. Angela and Mike expressed their concerns for the need of a support group for parents and caretakers of children with cancer. With the help of Bluebird, their vision, became a reality. So we sat down finally probably about four months ago and started talking and started creating. They were able to create the support group they envisioned, Guardians of Gold. We came up with Guardians because that fits for any type of a parent, parent or, or caregiver. And then gold is the color that signifies um, childhood cancer. Bailey Puckett, development coordinator at Bluebird, recognizes the impact support groups have within the community. People are making friendships, people are finding hope, and they're being encouraged, and they know that uh, Bluebird is a safe place where they can come and um, find the light in their dark times. Mike Rose hopes that he can provide support to fathers who may not always feel as if they can seek support. Everybody always thinks it's just for women, you know. It's me as a dad trying to help you know, a dad and or father trying to help maybe another gentleman, you know, walk through it. Guys have a lot of pride, sometimes won't say anything. The Rose family hopes that through sharing their own experience, they can help others see the light during their dark times. And I think it's so special that we have the Roses uh, leading this support group with us because they know what it's like. They've walked this journey. They're still walking this journey. Tegan won her fight against cancer this past spring. The Rose family hopes to expand their support groups so that others can win the same battle. And as for Tegan, remission has never looked so smooth. In Spring Lake, I'm Claudia Sella.
The Guardians of Gold Support Group meets at the Bluebird Cancer Retreat Spring Lake location. The meetings are held on the first Tuesday of each month from 6 to 7.15 p.m. For more information, you can visit bluebirdmi.org. A traveling art exhibit on GVSU Allendale campus sheds light on the reality of human trafficking. As the nation recognizes Human Trafficking Awareness Month, reporter Molly Wagner takes a closer look at an issue that hits close to home. I think it's a very important exhibit because it highlights violence against women. And, you know, that's an issue we all face and we all need to be aware of, whether we're women or men or, you know, young, young people. GVSU is hosting the art installation Los Zapatos Rojos, The Red Shoes, until February 28th in the Kirchhoff Center Gallery. The exhibit is the work of Mexican artist Alina Chavez. She created the piece in 2017 to raise awareness about the number of women who had gone missing from her neighborhood in Mexico. Some people in the U.S. might be surprised that it's happening right here, and women are often the target. We know that it's happening. I always tell people if it happens to one person, it's way too much. And we do know that it's happening in our communities. Chauvet created the traveling exhibit to put an end to femicide, a word that means the killing of a woman or girl because of her gender. The art installation is meant to honor those victimized by violence, but also represents a call to action. It's not just Mexican women disappearing. Dr. Joy Washburn, a GVSU nursing professor, says women in the U.S. are being abducted and forced into the sex trafficking business at an alarming rate. The reality is we don't really know the numbers. We know it's happening, and what we have actually prosecuted it will be the tip of the iceberg. Human trafficking is difficult to prosecute. Those statistics reported by the National Human Trafficking Hotline probably don't show the full extent of human trafficking. It does paint a disturbing picture. Almost 5,000 women in the U.S. disappear each year. Many are forced to work as sex slaves. According to Dr. Washburn, traffickers often pick victims who will not be missed. Washburn says that people are rallying resources and investing in institutions that can help victims of human trafficking. The National Human Trafficking Hotline is staffed 24 hours a day, 365 days per year. You know, I think any kind of outreach in terms of if you need help, go to someone you trust and then they can refer you to, um, to resources, whether that has to do with domestic violence, um, violence against women or directly human trafficking. All those organizations work together to address the issue and help victims. Wedgwood Christian Services Manassa Project is one West Michigan organization that is working to end human trafficking. Some of their programs help survivors of human trafficking recover and re-enter their communities. The community portion is what I get to do, which is the education, training, and awareness. Um, and then we have a, trauma, a specialized trauma recovery program for um, girls who have been exploited or commercially sexually exploited. And within our program, we try to give them a holistic approach to their healing and recovery. There's a, a lot of work that is being done with them to help with their reentry into the community. The Manassa Project also leads a public awareness campaign that educates the community on human trafficking. They encourage the community to get involved by educating youth and inviting groups to raise awareness and funding for anti-sex trafficking programming. But Dr. Washburn says they could use your help. Never underestimate how much what you donate in resources can help them. To donate or get involved with the Manassa Project, you can visit manassaproject.org. In Grand Rapids, I'm Molly Wagner. The Red Shoes exhibit will move to the West Wall Gallery in GVSU's Eberhard Center on March 6th and will be open until June 19th. A new photographic exhibit in Grand Rapids explores light, shadow, and rock and roll. Zach Goodrow has more in the story, including some pictures taken of an American music icon. At DeVos Place Building B, a new selection of Douglas Gilbert pictures has been showcased. For over 10 years, Gilbert traveled throughout Italy taking pictures from 1999 to 2010. His complete collection of pictures is archived at Grand Valley State University after a donation by Gilbert. This selection of DeVos Center, however, highlights his use of shadow and light photography. Shadow and light photographs are some of Gilbert's most profound works. 
Gilbert perfectly captures the light falling onto many different Italian landscapes and structures. He makes many monumental architectural structures look dynamic with his technique. Gilbert has thousands of photographs in Grand Valley's possession. Gilbert grew up in the Holland area and now resides in Grand Haven with his wife. Unfortunately, he's lost almost 90% of his vision while the years have gone by. This may be the end of his photograph career, but he's spent it to his fullest. One of his most special collections at GVSU has many people excited, like veteran radio talent and GVSU professor Len O'Kelly. I think you can't have a conversation about the music of the 1960s and not include Bob Dylan in the conversation. He's not a singer that a lot of people necessarily, you've got people who are either fans of Bob Dylan or they can't stand Bob Dylan. There's really not much beige on him. And it's the singing that normally, you know, people say, I can't, I can't stand his voice. If you look past the voice and you listen to what he was saying, he left an especially important mark on the popular culture of the 1960s. This is uh, Blonde on Blonde. This is an album I think I bought probably 35 years ago or thereabouts, if not even earlier. Um, this is probably the, um, my favorite of all of his. Um, what's kind of cool here about this one, I don't know how much glare you're going to get, but you've got one song here on side four, which nobody had ever done before, right? Nobody had done a double album before, let alone, you know, putting one song on a, you know, an entire side of an LP. Bob Dylan was a revolutionary artist in this time. Gilbert got an amazing opportunity to photograph him and he took advantage. Gilbert has taken pictures of a few artists in the 60s like Simon and Garfunkel and Iggy Pop, but the Dylan collection is one of his best. Oh, there's Simon and Garfunkel and there's, okay, trying to see, yeah, they're actually, they're labeled as you. Here you go, Iggy Pop, nice. So there's Dylan on his motorcycle here. This is the, um, this might be the bike he was riding after Blonde on Blonde came out. He was in a crash that basically almost killed him and took him out of the uh, music biz for a while. So there's Dylan and Joan Baez singing together. This is from Newport. The, the fact that there's pictures from the Newport Folk Festival in this collection, that's fantastic. There's Bob by himself from that same night. There was a day show and a night show and uh, We've got both of them there. There's Bob writing in a coffee shop, of course, you know, because that's what you do. A little plane in the coffee shop there. Just hanging out in the yard, upstate New York. That's Allen Ginsberg, the beat poet, who was one of Dylan's contemporaries. Douglas Gilbert's full collection is online at douglasgilbert.com. His exhibit from the Shadow and Light Pictures from Italy are currently at DeVos Place until June 19th. From Grand Rapids, I'm Zach Goodrow. Nathan Kemmler, Interim Director of Grand Valley's Galleries and Collections, says the Douglas R. and Barbara E. Gilbert collection is the largest collection of photographic images the university has ever received. To check it out, you can visit the DeVos Center in Grand Rapids. You can also go online to see rare images of rock and roll great Bob Dylan. Grand Rapids may have had a week of surprisingly warm weather, but the month-long world of winter continued its celebration of Michigan's cold season. Here's Hannah Swain with more on the city's dedication to an active and enjoyable winter. We are just getting people outside and the more people we can get outside, the better. Megan Cacho is the event coordinator at Downtown Grand Rapids, Inc., a nonprofit organization responsible for city building and management. Cacho says the city wants to encourage more people to come downtown in the winter. She says the World of Winter celebration is a great way to do just that. It's a month-long winter ice festival that we framed around Prismatica, which is an interactive art installation we brought to Grand Rapids. Prismatica is a world-traveling collection of 25 light prisms. Each prism transmits and reflects colored lights. The installation's opening weekend also included a silent disco. A silent disco is a new trend. It features people dancing to music on wireless headphones. A DJ may be performing, but the crowd seems quiet as they dance like no one is watching. It's fun and free, and dancers can choose from four different DJs. The silent disco also featured LED lights, a projector that shoots light beams through a crystal, and even LED furniture. So whether you came to sing a solo, dance in a group of friends, roast marshmallows over a fire, play a round of glow beer pong, or see Prismatica, the disco seemed to have fun for everyone. 
All proceeds from alcohol sales went to the Grand Rapids Asian Pacific Festival. They have a partnership with Downtown Grand Rapids Inc, DGRI for short, and are a part of the remaining schedule. So we help them in any way we could and of course would love to sponsor them because we want as many cultural events coming downtown as possible. DGRI's sponsorship in the Prismatica installation helped bring people to another World of Winter event, the first Lunar New Year Festival. Grand Rapids Asian Pacific Festival put on the celebration, along with DGRI, Saturday, January 25th to honor the start of a new Lunar New Year. Guests entered a heated tent and received a free raffle ticket for prizes that celebrate a variety of Asian cultures. The event provided participants with authentic food for purchase, performances from Calvin College, and an area for children activities. There was also a face painting station where I was given a pink azalea, a traditional Asian flower. Ace Mayor Segan, the CEO of Grand Rapids Asian Pacific Festival, says the world of winter was a perfect opportunity to spread cultural awareness in Grand Rapids. But world of winter is perfect because it's where we could bring all people, uh, make sure we invite all the neighbors, so that's what we call neighbors, to, in, to, to get to know their neighbors from, from the east. And uh, this is a great opportunity, like you said, safe place to ask questions. We want people to ask questions. We want to be able to articulate and explain uh, many, many of the cultural aspects of the lunar celebration. The Lunar New Year lasts for about 10 days in marking the beginning of the Chinese Zodiac. 2020 is the Year of the Rat. The festival included traditional Asian performances. One of the dances, called the Lion Dance, was performed in front of the Prismatica installation. I want this to be annual. I, I, there's no reason for this to not to be an annual thing. I feel like Grand Rapids is going to embrace this. And um, there, what's, what's to stop it, right? Mary Segan says the festival would not have been possible without DGRI and their involvement. But the partnership with Downtown Grand Rapids Incorporated is giving us a lot of traction, a lot of uh, attention towards the, the Asian Pacific community, so we appreciate that. It seems the world of winter has had a successful start to its celebration. Megan Cacho says there's much to look forward to until the finale on February 15th. It's called Paint the Park. You can come out to paint the ice at Rosa Park Circle and there's a giant street party, there's like princesses from Frozen, you get your face painted, there's a 5,000 pound community ice sculpture, so that's gonna be a big one. But in the meantime, stop by 555 Monroe Avenue during both day and at night, just like I did, to experience a light-filled winter. The World Touring Prismatica exhibit will be available on Monroe until February 16th. I'm Hannah Swain in Grand Rapids. Downtown Grand Rapids Inc. will be continuing the winter festivities with its next event, Love on Ice on February 14th at Rosa Park Circle. Continuing our coverage of things to see and do in the wintertime, I recently traveled to Grand Haven and found out just how folks celebrate winter in Coast Guard City. Grand Haven, Michigan, Coast Guard City is known for its sandy beaches, beautiful pier, and summer festival fun. But even in winter, this town knows how to draw a crowd. Well, we're new to we're the new area, area so we're, we're new yeah, but we've been told that you need to get out and get active to be able to really enjoy the long stretch, so that's what we're trying to do. Winterfest president Kevin Galbavi says Winterfest has a variety of events targeted at winter family fun. Surely you've heard of the cardboard sled race. But most of all, Winterfest has made fun for families at Kids Day, put on by Winterfest chairwoman Nicole Rant. To have something to do in the middle of winter for a family to have fun and get out of the house and something that's, for the most part, most of our stuff is free so you don't have to worry about that. Just really gets everyone out and about doing something and having fun. Ah, no, it's just a bunch of winter fun for everyone down here and we get everyone out to have a good time. The Winterfest chairholders agree that getting the community outside and active is one of the main goals of Winterfest. Some of the crowd favorites are the cardboard sled race, snow volleyball tournament, and ski and snowboard tournament. While Winterfest has exciting events all weekend, Winterfest is a nonprofit organization that has a larger interest in mind when planning this annual winter party. Kevin Galbavi, president of Winterfest, shares with us that all proceeds from this event will go towards rebuilding the iconic Grand Haven Lighthouse. 
As you can see behind me, we do have cars lining the parking lot of the Grand Haven Pier. It seems that even snow and wind won't stop these locals. Even members of surrounding communities come out to enjoy the beautiful scenery of the Grand Haven Pier. This is my favorite boardwalk in the whole state of Michigan and I just absolutely love it and it will always be my favorite. So The lighthouse is an iconic and signature part of Grand Haven and raising money to rebuild the lighthouse is only fitting for an event like this. In Grand Haven, Katie Myers, West Side Stories. Looks like they know how to have fun in Grand Haven. Katie, what was the most exciting part while you were down there? Yeah, it was just seeing everybody come out to have a good time. That's awesome. Well, it looked like a great story. But unfortunately, that's all the time we have for today. I'm Sean DeWard. And I'm Katie Myers. Thanks for watching and see you next week. West Side Stories is produced by students from the Multimedia Journalism Program at Grand Valley State University. Support also comes from the School of Communications, inspiring thought, perfecting practice. Thank you.